as you can probably imagine from the social media handle and the email address, she's a physicist. Um, and but we are very happy that she's here in her capacity as a Scala programmer. And um, yeah, this morning we have seen how to herd cats, but now we are going to learn about herding types, and in particular with with uh, Scala macros. And um, Scala macros are a really really a uh, particular success story in, in the Scala world. So I, I still remember uh, the days in 2013 when macros were all newfangled and people were doing all sorts of crazy stuff like <coughs> multiplying numbers in the type level. <laughs> and, uh, but now they have matured and I'm very happy to have uh, to, to uh, introduce Marina who's going to uh, talk about how to use macros to uh, herd types. So please have a warm welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm a Scala developer, as you can see. Um, today we'll talk about how to use Scala macros to work with schemaless SQL data storage and how macros can help you to reduce random errors in your applications. We can use schemaless storages to build distributed cache or for the task when we need fast response from the database. But sometimes there is only a Java library available for us, and uh, we can work with a trusting compilator with everything like we used to in Scala. And today we will try to solve this problem by writing a small library on Scala macros for Java driver. As it says, I took a respite, but this approach can be used for other schemaless storages. So, roadmap for today. Uh, first, I would like to tell you about our spike and how we store information in it. After, I will explain uh, what I think schemaless SQL data storage driver has to do and why it's so important for applications to operate with types. And finally, I will show you my view of the type safe solution implemented with Scala macros. Since it's a short talk, we will discuss the idea and a small example. So if anything is unclear, you can always ask me in person or by email. I'll be happy to answer. So Airspike is a schemaless storage. And if you want to change the type of the data, you don't have to modify a schema. In a spaces, records belong to logical containers called sets. Every record has key as unique identifier, meta information like time to live, and bins with data. Information can be stored in one bin or different bins. Uh, they can have one type or a different type and the value of the bin can always change. For example, the bin ID with a string value Bob can always change to a different string value or even to a different data type, such as integer. All values can be any native supported data types like in, string, map, and so on. Dealing with storages like this one could be tricky because it has no scheme. It means when you have information and you create a data model, and here it's a bunny, and then you store it, and when the next step is to get what you have stored, you somehow end up with something <laughs> unexpected. This happens because you don't know what exactly you will get. Because driver, in case with error spike, doesn't provide you such information. It gives you a record with some object, and you have to get whatever it is there and try to cast it into expected type. We cannot avoid all possible problems here, but we can reduce the probability of obtaining them by generating passes at the compiled time. The only thing we have now to connect to our spike is a driver written in Java. So to get bunnies instead of donkeys, we'll have to write a lot of code with it. So let's take a look at this code. We'll start with storing the data. We know there is no scheme in this database, and if you want to store a couple of different values with different keys, we'll have to define the client and prepare information, keys and bins. We will write something like that. Uh, Java client provides several constructors for keys and bins, seven types of keys and 12 types of bins. So as you can see, more types means more code. But we're in Scala, and we can use any type of one. We have plenty of choices from primitives like in string to more complicated ones, like collections of students or cats, 
because for us there is actually no limit. And we also want to write less code. Okay, imagine we wrote all information into storage and all values were converted into the internal databases format. But this storage, along with Java driver, doesn't don't have so many types as Kyle does. For example, byte short boolean and n will be stored as a long value, float as a double, and so on. And we still have to return the exact type that we stored, not the one that it became. The thing is, we will also choose how to store information, which is a big plus for us. Take a look at the small bot here. HList is a heterogeneous list, which is an arbitrary line of tuple. In case with this storage, where information can be stored in many bands and they can have different types, I think an HList is a perfect bet. And I decided to store it as a native map value. And I also did the same for the keys classes. Okay, we wrote all information into storage and now we know how it looks like inside this database. Now all we have to do is get data, which is supposed to be a simple operation, but it's not. A Java client provides uh, 13 different get methods with policies, listeners, and other stuff. And we will have to spend time choosing the perfect one. And this is just the beginning because all of these methods will return us a record and we will have to write passing functions for every possible type. And this is the record that get function will return us. Take a look at the map of string object. This is neither a donkey nor a bunny yet. It's a still a secret for us until we will try to pass it. Okay. okay, imagine we wrote everything. We wrote all functions to get information of the expected type. But still, after all we've done, all create and fetch functions, we still have to write a lot of code with it to get information of the exact type that we store. But when we provide type safe interface, it means that application of functions should be short and simple. It should be like that. At least this is how I see it. So, what schema is killer that storage's driver had to do? First of all, the API of a client itself has to be more concise. Second of all, it has to take care of serialization, because every day we have to face that problem, especially when it comes to Java libraries. And finally, it has to work out of the box. So let's see what we can do here. So finally, implementation. Take a look at this slide. We have here a function that knows what to do with keys and bins in TypeSafe Mana. Keep in mind that there is a number of actions that Java Clamp allow us to do, like add, delete, and so on. And for that, we have first parameter. In most of these actions, you can operate with keys and bins but I don't want to call key and bin creation functions every time, so I decided to delegate that out to the implicit named key and bin rabbits. So I could just pass particular values of any type I want and let those implicit do all transformations for me. So how implicit will work in this case? Let's call a function that will store a one string value with a string key into storage. What is actually happens here is that wrappers of type string will appear in, in their places. It means that they happen to be in the scope. Otherwise, we will have an exception which says that implicit are missing. So we will have to write down more than wrappers. And since it's a short talk, we will discuss only bin wrappers. But the idea for the key start is the same, so I think it's the most interesting part. Um, we will start with bin wrapper for type B. We have here a function to convert value into bin and another one function which accepts the record and returns the expected type with meta information. The difference between types here will be in this very important function fetch where we do type checking and value getting for every uh, type. An instance of that helper has to appear in every file where you communicate with the database. So we will obviously have to write down more key wrap bin wrappers for other types, but I don't know what I will use in the future, like in strings or maybe collection of cats. And I want to write more code every time. So we will need here some magic. And there is some magic. There are macros. Macros in Scala 
allow to create sections of code at the compile time. They are based in the context class. An instance of this class is always passed to the macro during expansion. Then it can import the universe object and request descriptors of types, methods, and so on, exactly as in runtime reflection. In fact, in fact macro is a function that accepts syntax tree and returns the change one. But every magic trick has, a, has its price, and every, every syntax tree should contain every feature of Scala. And one of the drawbacks of macros is that description of these trees is not so easy to read. For example, the code fragment 1 plus 1 in generation should look like this. And things get worse when we need to present larger pieces of code with the substitution of templates. But lucky for us, in Scala 2.11, this rebec is solved, and we have quasi quotes. With quasi quotes, our 1 plus 1 will look a lot more simple. In general, quasi quotes is a collection of string interpolators that are located in the universe object. You can import those into the current scope and then use a series of characters before the string constant, which will determine how the compiler has to handle it. So, now we can define our object being wrapper with quasi quotes. Macro materialize over there, upstairs, and um, Macro here is an implicit, and we already know what it means that an instance of this bin wrapper of any type will appear in the right place when it's necessary for itself. The weak type tag here is the way to get description of type B with method from universe object. <coughs> Since the difference between types here will be in one function, we can insert into quasi quotes another quasi quote with type checking. And one more thing, if you want to use any other functions inside macro, you, you can do that. All you have to do is just import those in, inside the macro or direct, directly in the file where your macro has to appear. So, uh, we will compare in the fetch value the weak type of function results with method from Scala Reflect API. Uh, we know that string is stored as a string, but for example, each list is stored as a map, and we also know that this storage has a lot less types than Scala does. So that map is de definitely not what we ordered. And we will have to write a function that will get us the collection of values that we stored into in this uh, list, And then we can call the list function and get the exact list that we stored. And we can do the same for other types, of course. So, what will happen if we will call materialize function for an H list of n boolean, for example? This is the piece of the compiled code. At the compile time, an instance of this particular fin wrapper will be generated exactly as we want it, with all imports, values, and methods. Uh, take a look at the fetch value. It took the right part of the fetch value for this particular H list. So we have here an instance of, for this wrapper that is ready to use it in this scope. And with macros, everything is under your control. If you want to take a look at the instance that will be created, you can always do that. Uh, one of the ways is just to print the result, which is exactly what I did to get this example. And what will happen if we will call materialize for several other types? Instances of different bin wrappers will be generated at the compile time. So it's not exactly magic, but the code is there and compiler wrote it for you. I had a lot of tests before I defined the type correspondence between Scala and the storage, but in my opinion, user always has to have a choice. So if you want to store your information in some different way, you can always do that. For example, if you want to store bunny1 as a map and bunny2 as a JSON, you can specify custom wrappers and then pass them explicitly into the function call because you have two of them in the scope and you, you, will be, you, you will have to help the compiler to pick the right one. So, uh, code source for this DSL is available on GitHub and here is the link and dependency to try it. And there is also the link for the aerospike.com uh, they recently added my library on their page.
on their page. So I'm very happy about it. Thank you. So that's, I think that's a great use of macros. That's really like hitting a sweet spot for using macros. But uh, as I was reading the code and like doing code review in my head, I was thinking, do you really have to throw exceptions? <laughs> <laughs> Not really, it's just an example simplified, but so sometimes your, I do. I mean, in the final version of the library, why don't you return an user type or what? Uh, I guess that user has to, you know, has to know about it. But then either like, type, the person would know about it, if it's either good or bad. Mm, that's Something good. to consider. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so at Scala Days, there was a talk comparing different approaches to metaprogramming based on either shapeless or macros. And um, apparently you decided to go with macros and I was wondering whether you had considered using shapeless for this kind of thing. Of course, I use instead macro. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Hello, shapeless actually. Right, but w was there any specific feature that you figured you couldn't implement uh, based on shapeless and you have to go with macros? No. There isn't, actually. It's, the, it's just a choice. So okay. I made a choice to do the, uh, this with macros, but I also have shapeless inside, so. <laughs> right, yeah, no, I did see that. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks, okay. <laughs> thank you, if you have any questions, you can always find it in the hall. Okay. <laughs>